The enormous cleanup effort presenting major technical challenges after that devastating bridge collapse in Baltimore. I'm Jay O'Brien in Washington. In today's big story, the race to remove that cargo ship and the massive tangle of wreckage from Baltimore's harbor. I'll speak with a civil engineering expert about the difficult task ahead and just how long it might take to get that port back up and running. And in our spotlight, the record-breaking fundraiser for Joe Biden, featuring two former Democratic presidents I'll talk to our panel about whether it was a missed opportunity despite raking in tens of millions of dollars. But we begin with our big story. Massive cranes and thousands of workers are headed to Baltimore at this hour to join the ongoing cleanup effort after that devastating bridge collapse. They're trying as fast as they can to get the harbor home to the ninth largest port in the country up and running again. And that's going to take some time. More than 1,000 personnel from the Army Corps of Engineers are already there. And they brought this, the Chesapeake 1000, the largest floating crane on the eastern seaboard. But still, some of the debris is even too heavy for the Chesapeake, so it has to be cut up into more manageable pierce pieces. Here is everything these crews have to do, just to give you a sense of what they're up against. They have to get the huge steel trusses of the bridge that are currently blocking the waterway out of the river. They also have to get the pieces of the bridge that crashed onto the dolly, that ship, off of the ship. At some point, they're going to have to tow away the dolly, and they've got to dredge up all the concrete and steel that has already sunken to the bottom of the river there. This is going to take months, not to mention crews still haven't recovered the bodies of four construction workers who were on that bridge, missing and presumed dead. So joining us now for more, Marcia Geldert Murphy, president of the American Society of Civil Engineers. This bridge is massive. The midsection of it is gone. Give me a sense of how big a bridge of this size is, if you don't mind, so that we can get a sense of what crews are facing in the fact that they have to clear it up. Well, you know, basically you can see when you look at the Chesapeake 1000 from the footage that you just showed, it dwarfs in comparison to the bridge in the background. The main span of the bridge is 1,200 feet long. So that lets you, gives you some sort of perspective of how much is still there. And as you said, that crane can lift a thousand tons. But what we're looking at in those sections is probably four times that amount. So it has to be cut in sections that can be removed that the crane can handle. This bridge was built in the late 70s. We've heard Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg say, Marcia, that newer bridges are built uh, to more rigorous safety standards. But is there a way that any bridge, regardless of when it was built, could have withstood the impact of a head-on collision to appear uh, of a ship of this size like the kind of collision that we saw? Well, we can always build a structure that can withstand some mighty forces, but we don't have the resources to build those kinds of structures. We wouldn't be able to build a lot of other things. And the whole idea of protecting the piers is so that you don't have a direct hit on a pier in the water. So they are not made to withstand a direct hit. When you look at protections out in the water, it's to glance any ships away from the piers so they don't have a direct hit. And that's the problem. I think we all saw the footage, the devastating footage of that ship heading straight for the pier. And they can't withstand that kind of impact, that kind of load. These ships are so enormous. They're so large. These are not loads that they would have even anticipated or imagined back in the 70s when this was being designed. So, Marcia, you know, eventually a new bridge is going to have to be rebuilt there. The president is committed to the federal government uh, paying for every dollar of that new bridge. In your experience, how long could a project like that take? And what are we talking about in terms of cost? Are we talking tens of millions or, or hundreds of millions? It, this will definitely be in the hundreds um, category, in my opinion. Of course, it's all going to depend on what the replacement bridge looks like, what kind of methods are being used. 
but you know, Jay, the, the important thing is that this is a process that has to take place. First of all, they've got to clear the channel. They've got to clear it safely. They've got to remove the, you know, the, the damaged bridge first to at least open up the, the channel for new traffic. And then they've got to remove the rest of it. And so they can, and then they've got to remove the existing ship. So all of this has to happen first. And, you know, to be honest with you, what we've got to remember is there's no hacks to this process. There are no shortcuts. This has to be a meticulous, methodic process so it's done safely and effectively. But I can tell you and all your viewers that the best and the brightest in maritime engineering and Coast Guard and Corps of Engineers are on this case. It's unprecedented the number of, of people with the kind of expertise you need right now are all at work trying to solve this as quickly and as safely as possible. Marcia Geldert Murphy, president of the American Society of Civil Engineers, someone whose expertise we also need right now. Thank you for your time. I want to bring in our big story panel now. Joining us today is ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse, ABC News contributor and former Republican Congresswoman of Virginia, Barbara Comstock, ABC News contributor and president of Next Gen America, Christina Sinson Ramirez, and ABC News contributor and op-ed columnist for the Los Angeles Times, Elsie Granderson. Welcome in all. Barbara, we start with you. There are some Republican spending hawks already in Congress who have come out and tried to pour cold water on that promise you heard me mention from the president about paying for every dollar of rebuilding the bridge. Is this project, if it ultimately has to go through a congressional appropriation, going to face some resistance? Well, hopefully not, because this is not just about Maryland. It's about the entire country. It's about the economy. You know, so much goes through here. So yes, you will hear those same voices that if there is a tragedy in their own state, they, they throw those views out the window. Uh, but once again, it is so important that Congress comes together on this and get the, gets this done, and that those voices very much need to be overridden, those conspiracy theories, all of that. This is an, a national emergency that needs to be addressed very seriously. Christina, it's necessary that we remember here that there were eight construction workers on that bridge. All of them were immigrants. Two were rescued. They were found. Uh, their, two had their bodies found yesterday. And there are four still unaccounted for and presumed dead. Their co-worker spoke to the New York Times. He said, quote, we're low-income families, end quote. He said they're keeping their families afloat both here in the U.S. as well as in their home countries. How is this tragedy, in your view, shedding light on the struggles of those workers? Look, there are migrant workers that are fundamental to our economy in the construction industry, domestic work, farm work. In my home state of Texas, foreign-born workers make up 70% of the workforce that build our homes, our schools, our roadways. These are dangerous, difficult jobs. And I think it shows and sheds light on the courage and contributions of migrants in a time when we're talking about how we don't need migrants. What we need is a system that allows us to not only accept their labor, but their full humanity as well, and protect American workers. And I hope this sheds light on that and pushes forward legislation to do just that. Elsie, there's somebody here that a lot of Americans have gotten very familiar with now in the press conferences and all the coverage, and that's Maryland Governor Wes Moore. This is a, a significant test for him. Um, he is new to that role as governor, but obviously he'd already had somewhat of a national profile before then. Uh, how, in your view, do you think he's handling this crisis so far, and, and frankly, how the state of Maryland is handling it writ large? Well, I think he's been very smart in terms of not... <clears throat> getting so caught up with the financial and economic impact of this, that to Christina's point, he forgets to mention the humanity. You know, earlier this week, he's already floated out the idea of establishing permanent scholarships for the children of the migrant workers who were lost. And so you already see him threading the needle between recognizing global commerce, but also recognizing the humanity that was lost. So I think he's been fantastic in this. And Jay, I would tell you, President Biden is actually coming there next week as well. And it'd be really interesting to see how much politics he leans in versus being the compassionate Joe who's always been there when we've had tragedy. 
Uh, Mike, it, you may know this. Um, our viewers may know this too. It's called the Francis Scott Key Bridge because it's approximately where Francis Scott Key was when he wrote the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, they unfurled a big Star Spangled Banner, uh, Star Spangled Banner, excuse me, at the Orioles game yesterday. We have seen the city of Baltimore in that demonstration and others come together in this moment. Uh, I, I, how has it been like for you to watch that? It's been beautiful to watch. I think that's the beauty of America when we have crisis, how much we put aside our partisan differences and pull together for the greater good of Americans, in particular as they were really uh, big on recovering uh, all the ones that have been lost, you know, in order to do what's right for their loved ones. I'm just thinking right now, Jay, of the marvel of engineering that is about to take place. As a former engineer, uh, this is what you prepare for in all of your college classes and curriculum, is these major case studies of hypothetical situations of what will happen. And this is a time when the Army Marine Corps of Engineers shine. Uh, that group mm -hmm. of individuals is a well-tested, well-trained uh, group of engineers who can handle uh, what seems like an impossible situation. Uh, it's going to be an engineering marvel to look at them project manage this, as well as be able to create the solutions uh, to put it in place in order to clear uh, the bridge and the channel. This is engineering marvel uh, witnessing right before us is nothing like American ingenuity and innovation. We think about it so much from Silicon Valley, but this is really the heart of America ingenuity is this engineering, and we're about to see our finest engineers uh, at work. I know some folks in the Army Corps of Engineers. They are the best of the best. You are exactly right. Mike, Barbara, Christina, Elsie, thank you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.